So essentially, when we bring this group of people together, what we're trying to do is to understand who is the system, right? What causes things to change? What causes things to grow? And I have an exercise in the book that says identifying your top 100. It's just, it's just a, 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 a um, exercise I take people through where we, we, we sit and we brainstorm and brainstorm and brainstorm until we get 100 people. That the, if those 100 people were all in agreement, we're pretty convinced things would change. So we begin to look at that. And I really work with people because I don't just work at the obvious. You run out of obvious at about 20. You know, maybe 30. And then you start to say, well, who else now? And so then you start to bring in all the informal systems that I'm particularly looking for to eliminate a they. But you bring together a group of people. Often they form as a leadership round table. You know, and in vibrant communities, it's usually 16 people, four from each sector. Four people living in poverty, four people from government, four people from business, four people from the voluntary sector. And they meet together on a regular basis and start hosting these broader conversations. There's a lot of working groups that go out there. But what we want to do is we want to start to bring people together to engage their energy and passion. That's a big part of social change here, right? Is just really energizing people, getting people to feel engaged, that they're working on something exciting and new. The second one is gaining a shared understanding of the issue. Everybody know David Pico from the Toronto, Toronto City Summit Alliance, one of the best collaborators in, in the country. Um, and send him your positive energy. He's really going through a hard time with cancer right now. Um, but David is brilliant from the Boston Consulting Group. And what he talks about is when he brings, I've been on a number of collaborations that he's led. Um, and the first thing that he says that you need to do is give people a shared understanding of the issue. Victoria, that's the example, where they started to not just get a shared understanding between all the leaders, they wanted the community to have a shared understanding of what was going on. And he said the very act of gathering data and evidence together and talking to each other about that data and evidence is a key early conversation about bringing people together. Because what you're now doing is you're bringing diverse players with diverse backgrounds from diverse sectors, you're, you're, you're giving them the opportunity to come up with common understanding and language. You see how that important that is? Because so much of entering into conversation is you bring what you know to a conversation. You see the world through your lens. As Mark Kabaj, my colleague, often says, he who has a hammer sees everything as a nail. You know, you're trained as a social worker, you see everything as a social worker. You know, and we do, because especially if we do it for a lot of years and we're really passionate about it, we come at it from a lens. Business people come at it through a lens. One person once said to me, a person who made several million dollars producing the right um, uh, knob for rolling up the window, there are people who've done this on the Ford Taurus, right? Um, it's pretty hard for them to have a global view of the world because that's how they made their money. It was a very specific way of doing something. So now we have to sort of break that down and get people to look at it a little bit differently. The other one is that we got to give the time for people to aspire to large-scale change together. That's why they're entering into this conversation, right? Because again, you know, I, again, I, I go back to this, this community that brought me in to deal with gang violence and for, with that shooting, the first thing they wanted to do was to create a committee so they could get funding to get more kind of community policing type stuff into the community. And I said, so that's the problem. You know? or, or, or those group of business leaders you know, who said that they, what they were really going to do is drive all the young people out. That wasn't going to solve anything. That's no vision. Right? That's not a vision for change, and that's just a waste of time. Right? So we need time to come up with this large-scale change together, and particularly since we want to mobilize the community, the question is, what's going to mobilize the community? Going back to Hamilton, right? Poverty wasn't going to mobilize the community, but raising Hamilton, the best place to raise a child, that was going to mobilize the community. The quality of life challenge, right? It was, it was taking what Victoria felt about themselves, turning it around, 
and using it as a huge vision of a quality of life for all. Mobilize the various constituencies. That takes time. Right? You'll bring a round table together and you might have a hard time getting people that have had mental health, health challenges come forward to be on your working group and to really be able to mobilize them. On other hand, times you might have problems getting business involved um, or certain levels of government involved. And what you're starting to do is you're working together and that's what takes the 18 to 24 months. Right? The other one is just this whole notion of what we call um, action learning um, or um, action um, doing or planning, but essentially where, where we're, we're moving into a cycle of starting small ideas and projects and they kind of fuel that conversation, um, but essentially it's this whole mechanism of where we plan together, then we do something together, then we reflect on it, and that feeds our knowledge and we get back to planning again and we start doing. It's that whole kind of cycle that begins to happen. Here's just a very quick um, definition of collaboration. I think it's a bit long. I might change it these days. This is a bit interesting because you might think to yourself, is this a good community for collaboration? We do this all the time. These are some of the patterns from the 300. So we started asking ourselves, what makes it work? So is there a strong history of collaboration in Durham region? It's an interesting question. Um, you know what uh, Orangeville did or Headwaters or Dufferin County at the time? I'm always getting Dufferin and Durham mixed up in my head today. Uh, is that the first thing they started to do is they created a series of awards. And they went back 50 years looking for collaboration. And because these cities were so fractious. Uh, so they were trying now to create collaborative awards. And they talked about those collaborative awards. And they started creating collaborative heroes in their community. Because they didn't have a very good history of collaboration. So they had to pull together. When that arena was built, guess who built it? And they started talking about things differently. So that they could show how these communities had come together in the past. The second one is is when you pull together a group, so when, if a group, usually a group has started to form when we're brought in to look at it. So one of the things that we question is, is this the group that is perceived as community leaders? Right? And so what does that mean, people say? Well, I say we need definitely to have a few people there who have positional power. But that doesn't need to be the whole group. It's not all about positional power. Matter of fact, if you fill the room with people with positional power, uh, oh, you're dead in the water right from the very beginning. Right? They're just a bunch of egomaniacs. That's how they get there. Right? Just joking. But you've got to have a mix, right? <laughs> but you've got to have a mix. And so what we say is that these people with positional power, uh, we really also need leaders who have the ability to convene. So we often say the most powerful people for collaborations are those who are, who are seen as respected by their peers. And if they were to invite 10 of them to a meeting, seven or eight would show up. So we're looking for those types of people um, who can convene, who have the ability to bring people to the table, who have the ability to bring people into conversation. And the last one is really whether the issue you're dealing with has a favorable social and political climate. Here we go again about how you frame an issue. Going back to that example of Hamilton, instead of dealing with child poverty, dealt with that wasn't getting any traction. So they, they, they moved to an issue that would get traction. So these are some of the things that we look for. How do they get started? Interesting, a whole bunch of different ways. But this is kind of an interesting one, is that often it's just this natural evolution of a loose group of organizations. Remember I talked about the hospital in Dufferin County. It was a group of health professionals that have been meeting for a lot of years. That's an example. And often you'll look at that. You, all of us are connected to some form of group, either informal or formal, that meets on a regular basis. right? And so often it's those groups that start to feel and rise up to something different and that the people that you're starting to meet in those groups. You know, maybe it's a ministerial association you know, that says, okay, we're tired 
of all this stuff happening and, and us not doing enough about it, right? So how can we do that? And it's not going to be everyone. Uh, one of my favorite collaborations is actually in Waterloo Region, and it's the Interfaith Coalition, uh, where they brought 17 religions together. Um, and uh, they just started as a conversation, but then there started to be some hate crimes started to occur in our community. And they were able to speak with one voice against those hate crimes. I remember in one time, there was a swastika um, painted in a graveyard and how they went there together and repaired that gravestone physically together with the media present. And all, you know, you, all the faiths, 17 faiths, were there cleaning off this swastika and talking about how they were one together and how they were going to work together. I thought it was quite beautiful um, around that. Other times it's an explosion of frustration. I remember in Toronto, remember when we had all those shootings, I think there were 14 in a row, and suddenly we were mobilized and all kinds of collaboratives started to happen around making Toronto a safer city. Sometimes it's induced or mandated from the outside, right? Any of you been induced? Result wasn't bad, huh? You guys know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh. It's a good thing. Right. So often the government forces it. It's a great opportunity to get people to work together. I remember the urban Aboriginal strategy, how frustrating it was to work in urban areas when you had such diverse Aboriginal groups and the government just threw out its hands at one point and said, we can't do this anymore. I mean, it's so unproductive. You've got to come together as Aboriginal communities and come to agreement together. So they forced the collaboration. It's a fantastic thing <laughs> that they did for bringing more money to the community, more organized services, and so forth. A moment of inspiration. I told you the story of Bill Gale. I can tell you 10 more of people that were one person that got inspired about doing something and started gathering their friends around them. Not even friends, just colleagues and people that they knew and said, we need to do something more about this. Margaret Wheatley often talks about following yes. Anybody read her? Margaret Wheatley? Fantastic. Leadership in the New Science, other books. I'll send you links to her work as well. Um, amazing woman who writes on, who looks at sort of leadership through organic science, biology, and starts to say if living systems work this way, then wouldn't it be wise for us to think about the natural order of leadership? So she looks at the natural order of leadership and says, then how could we reorganize ourselves so that things might be simpler? And she wrote this fabulous book called A Simpler Way. 